with the lovely Penn Gillette, and I couldn't be happier to be interviewing you because I'm a big fan. And um, I guess, does he need an introduction? He's a magician, he's a musician, he's a raconteur, he's a writer, he's a director, he's an inventor. No, nope, not a director. No, no directing ever? No, no, directing is for schmucks. Oh. <laughs> Only losers are directors, I do not direct. Okay, wow. Keep going with the other um, stuff I do. Great, most important to us, I think, that now he's going to disagree with me, but a great, great voice, an important cultural voice for skepticism and atheism and rationality and science-based thinking. And I know so many people who listen to you, including myself, and you've influenced them very much, and it's very exciting and it's very important, and I hope you keep going at it. Thank you. Um, so first of all... Um, I was supposed to be interviewing Penn and Teller, but then Teller had quadruple bypass surgery. Yeah, about, uh, about uh, a month ago this Tuesday, a month ago this Thursday, so three weeks ago, uh, Teller had a quadruple bypass. Yeah. And I came from the airport, I flew in from New York, and I went directly over to the hospital. Oh, you did? And uh, I spent the time in the hospital between the airport and here with Teller, and he's doing, um, he's doing, doing very well, and he even showed me a card trick. Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Didn't which he I, and Moxie learn something together, which I, didn't which they? Which I believe is really him using sympathy <laughs> to be able to let me watch a card trick that he would do. Because <laughs> usually if Teller said, want to see a card trick, like any sane person, I would say, no. <laughs> but there he is. He's in the robe. He's got the scar down his chest. They took veins out of his dick, put it in his heart. <laughs> he says, want to see a card trick? It, it really is... Sympathy. <laughs> uh, it's a sympathy watching of a card trick. He did a card, which was good. It was a very, very. Was it a good card very trick? Very good. Use a key card. Very good trick. Couldn't figure it out. Used a key card. Couldn't figure it out at all. <laughs> very, very good trick. Okay. Well, if you want to, fo um, if you follow Teller on um, Twitter, he's been tweeting a lot about being in the rehab place and how he feels, and it's really lovely to be able to catch up with him that way. Yeah, and um, Mox, uh, yeah. Mox, my teenager Moxie, spent, uh, spent a lot of time over there working on magic tricks. Yeah, he was Teller. saying that, that yeah. they both were mastering one trick and they were very proud of themselves. Yes, they were. And uh, Moxie will not uh, talk to me about magic at all. She says she only wants to speak with the brains of Penn and Teller. <laughs> so she talked. And her, um, she started magic. She always tells people that her teacher was the great... Uh, Johnny Thompson, who was the mentor for me and for Teller, worked with us for 25 years, who died in, um, in uh, 19. And uh, uh, Mox was the youngest student of Johnny. Oh, really? And Mox oh, wow. always brags on that. You know, when they say, does your father teach you a lot of magic? Mox says, no. I go to the Johnny best. Thompson. Yes. M. Oh, children, they really can give it to you. They can really humble you quite a way. So Moxie's, what, how old is she now? She is 17. And did she get her driver's license? No. Oh, she I didn't. Don't know what, what is happening with that? I got my driver's license the day. Me too, the I day I turned it. 16. But there's yeah. a different thing. Um, um, people that are younger, because of, I don't know, all sorts of is reasons. Is it Uber? Is the it internet, what? Uber, and uh, maybe uh, more entertainment at more home. willing to drive. I yeah. But uh, they're in no hurry. They're yeah. In no particular, uh, neither of my children are in a hurry to get a driver's license. Wow. And I'm very much in a hurry for them to get a driver's license so <laughs> they can drive me around. Exactly. What do they think their job is in this world? Exactly. Um, but I was listening to, it's, is it, it's the Sunday morning podcast, Penn Sunday morning sermon. Penn Sunday school. It's Penn Sunday school. Anyway, um, you were talking about driving around with her in the parking lots, and that was so sweet. Yeah. We, we, I took her, uh, there's a place uh, uh, that's wicked flat, like a salt bed and stuff, and I took the very nice, we used to have a Tesla, but I just thought it was too fancy, so now I have a Mini, but <laughs> we used to have a Tesla, and uh, I let Mox open it up. You know, wow, you like you. Like 90. <laughs> I said, drive really fast and crazy and spin the wheel and stuff, because there's nothing around here. And did she frighten herself? Like, to me, that would be frightening to do, no? Uh, I, I, a little bit, I suppose. Because I maybe that's she why she's a, not she getting her. She has a lower uh, tolerance for fear oh, than okay. I do. I was perfectly willing to to die with Moxie on a salt flat in a Tesla. <laughs> Seemed like a fine flaming death to have. Ah. <laughs>
I've made my peace with God. <laughs> okay, that's an interesting question that I didn't have on my list. But as an atheist, how do you prepare yourself for death? In a, I've been thinking of that recently as I get older. Like, not like, okay, yes, I've had a great life. It's going to end when I die. But actually thinking about, it's like, say you're foot is caught on the train track and the train's coming, like you know it's gonna happen. What, how do you think? Well, I certainly give my life to Jesus Christ because he'll forgive me <laughs> and then no problem. I get all this credit for being an atheist that the last minute, thank you Jesus, and I go to heaven and <laughs> perfect. Get right. blown by Gilbert Gottfried. You know, just, <laughs> that's what we're all looking forward to in the afterlife. That's no, Gilbert. No, death has been very much uh, on my mind because um, Bob Saget was a, yeah. was a friend of mine, a friend of yours, I right. think, too. Well, an and I was very, very close to Gilbert Gottfried. Yeah. And, um, I was... Um, you were great on his podcast. Oh, I, yeah, I, I, uh, I love Gilbert very, very much. And yeah. uh, I'm very close to Dara, his wife, and, yeah. I, and his children. And so uh, when he was going into the hospital and when he was dying, I was, I was on the phone with him um, as much as you could be before he, right. before he was unable to be on the phone. And, uh, you know, Gilbert is, uh, was my age within, uh, I guess, within six days. Oh, really? Oh, wow. And um, so, um, yeah, I is. mean, I was aware of my own uh, mortality, I suppose. But now I really get the feeling we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really have that feeling strongly. And I don't know... Um, I have absolutely uh, no fear of death whatsoever. I'm not, I don't have any fear of that at all. Um, but uh, I do have a, um, a sadness at losing people. I yeah. Love. And I suppose I, I shouldn't say this because Teller, Teller is doing fine and he will, uh, he will recover. Yeah. Uh, the prognosis is all very, very good. If anything, he's ahead of schedule. But, you know, my, uh, my uh, partner of, 47 years when he goes into quadruple uh, bypass yeah. surgery, it's impossible that I didn't spend um, some time running scenarios that I would have rather not. Yeah. And um, so, I'm, you know, I'm very aware of, uh, of that. But I, I think when you take fear away and have it just be uh, regret, it's not that bad. I mean, I do know people that are um, mostly religious people who are, who are terrified of death and... Um, that must be uh, that, that must be horrible, but I, I think I think I'm doing okay with that. I think I'm okay dying. There's that great Stephen Wright joke where um, says his girlfriend woke him up and said, "If you were going to die in an hour, would you want to know?" And I said, "No." And she said, "Well, never mind." Um, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> but I don't know if I'll be. Uh, if I'll be as cavalier when I am actually See, I would want to know, show. because I would, I would try to... Well, we can yeah. have that happen, <laughs> I mean, there's one way you can know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but I, think, I guess my big fear is the pain. I don't, I, don't know, I don't think anything happens after we die, but I would like to avoid unnecessary pain. In, uh, in the first novel I wrote, uh, the protagonist is asked uh, how we'd want to die... And his answer was, um, slowly and in an incredible amount of pain, to prove I won't cry out to God. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, we ran, you know, I was, I, I was I, this is just bragging, but I was, I was friends with Christopher Hitchens. Yes. And I think Christopher Hitchens went through about as, um, as much pain yeah. as you were going to. And he even prepared, it was a, it was a wonderful thing. And once again, uh, whenever, I, I tried it with Stephen Wright, but... Whenever you uh, quote Christopher Hitchens, uh, every word, every syllable, all the enunciation is exactly right so that when you uh, quote him, it, it, all, it always sucks compared to what he would have done. But um, <laughs> Hitchens was asked if he, would, um, if he would cry out to God on his deathbed. And his answer was um, so profound and important. He said, I will be in more pain than I've ever been in in my life and I will be on more drugs than I've ever been on in my life, and they will be giving me uh, end-of-life painkillers, and I don't know what I might do. Uh, it's very possible that what is lying in the bed in pain and screaming will cry out to God, 
but that will not be me. Oh, that's great. He didn't. But, yeah, um, that's so great. Yeah, oh, wow. Uh, I mean, it, it addresses all sorts of stuff, like uh, a question that was brought up really, a really interesting question that I, I, I'd never thought about this way was, um, was a person who was asked about life after death uh -huh. and said, you know, before we can even address that, we have to address life during life. Right. Uh, the idea that there is some sort of entity that is us um, seems like nonsense to me. I'm not the same person I was right. 10 years ago in any way. Thank God. Uh, thank oh, God. I mean. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, if you're even talking about maintain a uh, maintenance of a of a of a of a self right. after death, I don't. I yeah, like who I don't would even that know be? what that means. Yeah. 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 I mean, my mother, who has dementia and is in a lot of pain, and at some, probably near the end of her life, I just look at it and think that, and she's a believer, and she does talk about heaven a lot, and I see how much comfort she gets from it, you know? And so I don't, at first I would say, well, I think, you know, blah, blah. Now I don't, you know, like I realize I don't say that anymore. But watching her, first of all, I see a lot of comfort she gets in the idea of heaven that I'm not going to have, and that's okay with me. I'd rather live in what I think is the truth rather than comfort myself that way. But um, but what I really notice is it's not, there's also, it dulls the appreciation of life in the moment too. Like it kind of robs you of actually the greatness of the fact that we are alive in this moment. Yeah, I, I don't even, I don't know how, uh, how eternity can be in any way right. a pleasant thought. I don't know how life exists without death. And I, I would, uh, I, I wouldn't argue with your mother, but I might argue with you. Um, I don't know what kind of comfort that really is. You know, my yeah, uh, it's also kind my, of a torment. My dad, my dad. I was very close to both my mom and dad, and my um, my dad died a believer. Uh, my mom uh, came out, as it were, as an atheist when she was eighty. Wow. So my mom uh, died um, in a great deal of pain and suffering and paralysis as an atheist. And my dad died um, with slightly less suffering, but still plenty as a believer. And I did not see a difference in comfort between the two. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think, I, I, uh, I just, um, uh, it wasn't what was advertised, you know. Right. What's advertised by, um, by theists is that somehow on the deathbed you get a great deal of comfort from that. And my dad did not denounce his religion, uh, but I didn't think, I didn't think there was that much comfort in it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's a skeptics group, so I guess I can say <laughs> I'm very skeptical that there's any, um, that there's any comfort at all that comes from uh, belief in God. Well, I actually would even go far. I suspect they know that anyway, people who are even saying they're believing. I don't know if I believe them. Yeah, exactly. I was once, uh, what's her name? Joy Behar had a show. And somehow in my introduction, it said, uh, Ben, ben Gillette's a hardcore atheist. And she said, <laughs> what does hardcore atheist mean? And I said, I think it means I don't believe other people believe. <laughs> Oh my God, that's so good. Uh, I, I, and I really don't, you know, um, um, I've thought about this a lot. When you see those um, tabloids, I guess, I mean, I don't, I haven't been to a supermarket in a while, but when they have those tabloids that yeah. say, you know, aliens have come into the White House and stuff, um, uh, which happened, of course. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, if if I were if I were given absolute proof, absolute proof that aliens had landed somewhere in the United States or in the world, I don't finish shopping. You know what I mean? I don't I don't pay. I don't give my credit card. I don't even call home. I think I just go there. I think I just if you believed it, that's the way right. you act. And I've often wondered about Catholics. You know who um, who have all this stuff about virginity before marriage. If if I actually believed in Catholicism, I think the entire staff of Kink.com 
<laughs> couldn't get me to have premarital sex. I mean, if that is the level you're talking about, um, right. eternal damnation, uh, I think the stakes are too high. So I don't know. I think maybe there's a whole lot of people who just think it's the right thing to say that you yeah. believe, and they really enjoy church, enjoy the you know the social aspect, right. which of course our, our our country is being destroyed by by loneliness. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I think QAnon may be little more than just a um, uh, a perverse manifestation of of of, of horrible horrible loneliness, uh, because you can be part of a group and really feel you know where one goes, we all go. It's all the skeptic the group is nothing like that. Well, yeah. well the skeptics group uh, <laughs> may be a little like that, but not as good at it. <laughs> um, I mean, people who have. Uh, People who go to church, I mean, I remember um, as a child, you know, we had, um, you know, boiled dinners and sugar eats for sugar eats for those who aren't from Yeah, Northern. what is that? You don't know what a sugar eat is. No. There's a thing called sugar on snow, which is when you take maple syrup, oh, uh -huh. which is the only thing that's good in New England except for maybe fentanyl. <laughs> um, there, <laughs> that's the two things we like the most there. Um, but in my little town of Greenfield, uh, they would have um, uh, maple syrup, which is, you know, reduced from the sap. And then if you, while you're boiling it down, yeah. if you get it right to a hard crack on a candy thermometer, uh -huh. uh, and you put it in a little styrofoam cup, and then you have a metal tin of snow. And I mean real snow that has twigs and rabbit shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then you take the little styrofoam thing <laughs> yeah. and you make a design in the snow and it puts the maple syrup at a, at a texture of like toffee, you know, like a oh. toffee or taffy. Like a caramel Those or something. Those are different words, aren't yeah. they? I think taffy is the word I mean, but stretchy and yeah. sticky. Taffy and you is. look at it and you go, this is going to be really good, right? Yeah. And then on the table, there are things that are inexplicable. There are dill pickles... Oh, interesting. And there are donuts without sugar or any sweetener on them. Okay. And you go, that's odd. Who would want to have dill pickles and plain donuts when we have this wonderful sugary thing? And you go, you take your mouth full, you go instantly into insulin shock, <laughs> and you clutch at the pickle and just... <laughs> and also saltines, regular saltines. And they would have sugar eats... Is this just your family or the whole... No, it's not my family. <laughs> it's it's all... like everyone around. It's oh, who's, common... who's been to a sugar eat? <laughs> yeah, I got a witness. Okay. Can I get an amen on sugar eats? <laughs> I guess I can't. Um, but um, it's really, really, really good. But I mean, my, uh, my, <laughs> my mom and dad who were in the church until my... Which, what church were they in? The First Congo. Oh, okay. Which is First Congregational Church of Greenfield, Massachusetts. Oh, wow. Um, which had gone back, you know, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you could not start a town without having a church. Was separation of church, never mind. Um, <laughs> but you couldn't have that. So that was the First Congo Church. It went back hundreds of years. And my mom and dad were very, very active in the church, and I was too. Um, I loved going to youth group. Uh, it's where I first read the Bible. It's where I first became an atheist. And how old were you, what did you say? Uh, I was 16, and uh, my mom and dad made a deal with me that I could go to rock and roll shows Saturday night, and stay up late, and not have to get up Sunday morning for um, church if Sunday afternoon at four, I went to church, uh, a youth group. And you're about 16 now. Yeah, when, yeah. and I went to youth group, um, Every Sunday, and uh, I, I bet they loved you. Well, that was the problem. <laughs> um, I went to youth group, and it was after uh, <laughs> I, we were encouraged to ask questions. And, They've uh, stopped that policy. We were encouraged to read the Bible, and I was—I yeah. I read the whole Bible, and I was—I was very—I was, very, I, I was very polite, at least as polite as I could be at sixteen, which is a very low bar. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, our, our pastor would talk to me because I would have every single question in youth group. Right. And the pastor finally called my mom and dad 
and said, um, you know, I don't think Penn needs to come to youth group anymore <laughs> because he's converting more people to atheism. <laughs> right, keep him away. Christianity. He actually <laughs> said that. And wow. I remained friends with him. He's Pastor Shaw. He was a wonderful man. And I love, you know, this is something that, uh, I guess I've said this maybe too much, but a lot of Christians, religious people, theists, will say to me, you know, you, um, what did, what did religious people do to you that was so terrible that turned you into an atheist? And I say it, it's quite the opposite. Right. Uh, they were nothing but kind. And that's such a loaded question. That's such an unfair question. Yeah. But, but the, my mom and dad, who were both Christian, and all the people in the town who were Christian were so kind to me that, uh, uh, and I had such a wonderful relationship with my parents that I didn't have this kind of fear of damnation. I really believe what made me an atheist was kindness. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't think I get credit for But for what do you mean? Like you think if they were meaner to you, you might be a believer? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I think if there were fire and brimstone... Like you didn't get fear, guilted because of it. Was that? You weren't made to feel guilty for no, not believing. No, You're saying I mean, that. Even okay. before I was a non-believer, I didn't feel this, this desperate clawing for something else. I had love all around me and people treated right. me well. And I think the, 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 the quickest way to make atheists is to treat people really, really well so they're not, um, they're not coming out of that... Coming that, out of that fear, right. and um, so I ended up. I was I was uh, friends with the with the pastor. I kept in touch with him, and my parents did not quit the church. And I'll tell this story very briefly. Um, they had a pastor, Pastor Shirley, uh -huh. who was um, this was in the in the nineties, who was a little bit more stereotypical typical lesbian than Gertrude Stein. Just <laughs> Okay. And uh, there was a time the United Church of Christ had a vote for being uh, open and affirming, I think it was oh, okay. called, that they were going to allow gays into the church. And uh, Pastor Shirley, without consulting the, um, the congregation, voted that First Congo Church would vote for open and, and oh, affirming. Oh, wow. And uh, the, um, the elders of the church, who were actually called the elders of the church, right. who were actually the elderly of the church, <laughs> um, uh, were very upset by that. And they also thought Greenfield, Massachusetts is a half an hour from Smith College. Uh -huh. And I think they thought that if they were open and affirming, that there would be an attack. Some Pastor Shirley's going to yeah. come over and yeah. try to make her way in. Yeah, well, Pastor <laughs> Shirley was already in. So oh. they, they did a vote and decided to fire Pastor Shirley. <gasps> and my mother... Wait, um, so she already was a pastor there at the church? She was the pastor there. She was the pastor. She was the pastor, and everybody liked her. She was doing a fine job. Wow. She voted for open and affirming. Oh, I see. She had a girlfriend that she was then... Right. It was more like, this is my girlfriend. And, um, and the church turned against her and fired her. And my mother, um, that, was, that was the bridge too far. Wow. Uh, my mother said, um, she, went to ch she went to the church and she said, we cannot fire Pastor Shirley, that's wrong. And uh, one of the people in the church said, well, read your Bible, homosexuality is wrong. Oh my and God. my mother, who never said hell, Never said damn, never said shit, motherfucker now and again. But no, <laughs> never, never swore ever. Right. Never swore ever. My mother said, which I think is maybe the strongest atheist statement ever made in New England, she said, fooey on your Bible. Wow. And my mother, my father, my sister, my brother-in-law, all quit the church wow. en masse, and they were big donors. And to show you the kind of people they were, they had pledged to the end of the year. Uh -huh. So they quit the church but kept giving money. Oh, gosh. And then when the end of the year came, they gave it to the um, fire department for Jaws of Life and stuff wow. like that. And they, they, came, they pulled completely out of the church, and my mom... Uh, uh, called me up and said, well, you know, I've known you were right for a while, but now right. I've got to say it. I'm an atheist. You know, your father, the old fool, he's still <laughs> Christian, but we'll deal with that. And then my dad, who was um, one of the sweetest people that ever lived, um, 
as he was dying in the final year of his life, um, I have to say this rather quickly because um, I will start crying. My dad said, um, it's going to be really hard for me to convince God to let you and your mother into heaven because you're atheists, but I promise you I will do it. Aww. So I'm oh, covered. You are covered. Wow. All right. Let's do this. Let's okay. go to your book, Random. Okay, okay so Penn has just written a book of fiction, and it's a kind of a mystery, and it's called Random. And I listened to about four hours of it now, and he reads it. Like, if you, I only was able to get it on Audible, but it's, you're really good reading it. You're, I mean, partly knowing you and your voice, but you're really good reading it. And the main character is this kid named Ingersoll, and he's in a desperate situation. It all takes place here in Vegas, but I really encourage you to either get the Audible, you know, the audio, or get the book. It's really good. Some of these people can read. I know. They don't, they don't need Audible. But it's real, like, and you, so tell us a little bit about your experience writing the book. You just went to New York and did an event in New York last night, yeah, right, for it? Yeah, a lot of um, things pimping the book, you know, going around. Do you think, you, okay, first, before you say, are you going to make it a series? With, do you think? Well, it was originally, uh, it was originally going to be a series. I want Ingersoll to be a series. <laughs> and uh, I, um. And I, Ingersoll, I, it's so perfect. Okay, go I ahead. I sold it, I sold it to Showtime, they bought it. Oh, they did, oh, then, wow. you know, show business, they, they didn't make it and then <laughs> someone else bought it and didn't make it and then during the um uh lockdown uh, uh, Ivanka Trump said people should you know write a book and learn a language so I did those because <laughs> I do whatever she says um but I got to uh I what was the language by the way was it what was the Spanish, language Spanish a little bit oh, okay poco. and um <laughs> I uh I uh I sat down and, and finally wrote it after 30 years. So you'd written the screenplay first, and you'd sold I'd the screenplay. The screenplay. Okay. I had just uh, it was it was it was um up uh, the idea was sold to be, be a showrunner okay. on and then do it. But uh, the idea came to me came to me. No, it's not my idea. Um, the idea was told to me um, 30 years ago, and I'm going to change some of this story to to pr to protect the privacy. Um, also, make it a better story. Um, <laughs> we were. Um, Working on a TV show over in London, and um, a woman that was working with us in a rather high position um, uh, called me into her office one day. Uh, uh, I didn't know whether it was like, hey, now, or I was in trouble. I didn't know right. what she was. But um, it was neither. And she asked me if I'd read this book called The Dice Man. And I said, uh, no, I, I haven't read it. I haven't heard of it. And she said, well, why don't you read it? We had a couple days off, and she'd given me homework. So I went and got the book and read it, and I came back back to work, and a couple days after, she called me to the office again, and she said, what'd you think of the book? And I said, well, you know, I, I don't like parody, and I don't like satire. I really don't like parody and satire, almost ever. And um, this book was a parody of Est, Warner Earhart, oh. and self-help in the 70s. And it was about this... Um, this way of making your decisions based on dice. And I said, so I, I didn't really like the book, but the idea that making, that what you want to do the most always wins. The society of your mind um, votes and you decide what you want to do the most. But then there's like another bunch of things that are really part of you that you really wanted to right. do that just didn't win. And those parts are not expressed. I also like the part of making a decision instantly uh -huh. and making a decision, you know, whatever the decision is, just acting on it. And I said, that fascinated me, but I didn't like the book that much. Uh -huh. And she said, oh, let me tell you a story. And then it got dark. Um, she okay. said she was very, um, very close to her brother. And several months before, she'd gone to her brother's apartment and she'd found that he had killed himself. He'd uh -huh. hanged himself. And uh, she... She did the minimum that you have to do when that happens to a loved one and then sat down on her couch and was unable to work or function or talk to friends. She became uh, to totally inactive uh -huh. for weeks and couldn't, couldn't get the gumption to, to go back to life. And she had read this silly book a little while right. beforehand and she said so she just she had dice at the house and she decided to make a bell curve and make these four or five things that she was going to do. And one was like, call a friend. Right. And one was like, 
go to dinner. And one was like clean the bedroom, you know, that kind of stuff. And she said she was going to roll the dice and whatever it said, she was going to act instantly. Uh-huh. And she did it and she did it. And she went and she said, everything changed. And I said, well, how long did you do this for? And she opened her briefcase. This is back in the 90s. Uh, opened her briefcase. <laughs> and she had two ornate dice in there. Uh-huh. And she said, I- I'm, I'm still doing it. And I said, oh, uh, you know, when we wanted, the producers wanted you to work on this show with us. And they said that you, you wouldn't do a show. We weren't a big enough show for you to do. And then everybody's really surprised when you did that. And she said, yeah, I rolled an eight. Oh, wow. I said, so you, you're, you're, you're doing our show because of a roll of the dice. <laughs> and she said, yes. And I said, and you're making a lot of artistic decisions on our show. <laughs> Are you doing some of those with a roll of the <laughs> dice? And she said, only when I'm not sure. Oh, wow. I said, so, so part of our show is random. And she said, yeah. And So wait, so she comes up with, tw- say, like on dice, I guess tw- she has 12 options of things that well, could no, happen. You can have any, any number of options you want. There's 11 r- right. rolls of the dice, but you... Um, you could have three or four and just assign, you know. Okay, but you numbers. do have to assemble the list because it seems like take the time to come up with your list of ten things you might do. Yeah, you have to go That's your list. investment of time. It's an investment of time, but you can do it really quickly. You learn very quickly, of course. I mean, you know already that, you know, two and 12 are the least uh, uh, likely, like 2.65. I don't Whatever know any of this. the exact number, shut up. But it's <laughs> around 2.65. I don't know any of this. Um, <laughs> but and, I believe uh, you. You also know seven <laughs> is most likely. Oh. So you, um, it's actually a really interesting exercise to decide <laughs> what things you're trying to decide to assign a value to them. Right. And you know, business people will tell you that making a decision is often more important than what decision you make. Yeah, I think that's and true. And acting on a decision is always more important right. than the decision. And so I, I, I was talking about this, like I said, for 30 years with all my friends. And two friends of mine actually ended up um, living dice life for a while. Dice which, life? Which really freaked me out. You know. <laughs> they, wow. Uh, they were, they're both women. It was, it was a couple of years apart. They were both going through very traumatic times. One was a divorce. One was a thing with their child. And they called me up and said, you, know, you were talking about that over dinner, the, the dice thing. I, I'm going to do it. And I said, I think it's really dangerous. And I think it's really irresponsible. And I don't think you should do it. But if you do, tell me everything. <laughs> so I, they called me every day while they were doing it. And uh, it was really interesting. They ended up expressing parts of their personality they might not have ever gotten to. Right. And they found it a really powerful and good experience. The, both of them, and this... This surprised me, but maybe it was the second one because I told her about the first one. But both of them said they ended up having sex with strangers at Starbucks. (laughs) And they said what they would do is they'd go in in the morning and they would say, (laughs) six, seven, or eight, I'm going to get a latte. (laughs) You know, five, I'm going to try one of those weird fruity tea drinks. You know, nine, I'm going to get a pastry. And two, there's a really cute guy in line behind me. I'll ask if he wants to sneak into the bathroom. (laughs) And they said, it's something I've always wanted to do, but it was never my first choice. <laughs> but it'll be my first choice of the future. Wow. They liked it. <laughs> That's hilarious. So oh, my God. These, I did a Q&A in New York City uh, last night. And uh, I asked, you know, uh, there were questions from the audience. And I told this story. And, you know, people raised their hand going, what Starbucks do your friends go to? <laughs> But so I, uh, I, I've been banging this around yeah. in my head forever. I would not do it. It's a not. really great idea. I mean, yeah. the whole concept of it is fantastic. Yeah, I would not live dice life because I don't believe in moderation and because I have a family and a job. And, and you already express it. all the aspects of your personality. Yeah, exactly, all of them. <laughs> and uh, I have one more I'd like to express right now. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, I, just, I was just fascinated by by being given that superpower. And one of the things I wanted to do, and I had to to go through great contortions, you may have noticed this in the book, but I wanted to make, you know, the characters you said, Ingersoll, Bobby Ingersoll, named after Robert Ingersoll. Yes. um, I wanted to make him a good guy. I wanted him to be uh, sexually 
very, very far in the fringe. I wanted to be very eccentric socially. I wanted to be sometimes not likable, but I wanted everything he did to fit within my morality because so many of the things that I love, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, one of the best shows on TV, Perpetual Grace Limited, Patriot, and um, also even um, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, wonderful, wonderful shows. I end up doing all this resolution, resolution of cognitive dissonance in that I'm rooting for someone who is outside my morality. Uh -huh. And that really bugs me. And I know it's good writing for your hero to have flaws. I know. And I know you're supposed yeah. to identify with that. But I was really, um, I wanted to have a, a protagonist in a book that was exciting and sexy and all of those things, but still always within my morality. So I went to a great deal of trouble to make sure it was like that in the book. I think maybe that that's a time that's passed because it seems like the only shows that are on TV, you, you get really used to rooting for bad people. But I don't ever feel good about it. I don't either. I felt this, I mean, I love Breaking Bad. I understand the artistry of it. I understand the skill of it. I was totally sucked into it. But I agree. I, I feel like it became this kind of quote unquote sophisticated trope that you take an unlikable character and make them the main. And yeah, I get that. And they're interesting, they're fun, they can have all these flaws. But in the end, it in itself becomes lazy. Like make somebody you genuinely want to root for, like that you like as a person. Yeah, I, I, I think that, well, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, okay, so anyway, so you write, so you wrote the book during the pandemic. Yeah. And now it's just come out, just this month. Yeah, it just came out, and uh, I guess it's doing, uh, well, the Audible book is in some subcategory, like the, <laughs> the coldest day. Dice know, life category. You know, dice life category, yeah. <laughs> Weather records, you know, coldest day in Tulsa in November. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I think in like uh, cr dark, crime something it's the audio the audible book is number one or something so that it's, feels it's, that must feel doing, great because my novels oh thank you um i've written one other novel and my uh, my fiction does not do well my essays have got, right. you know, they've done bestseller stuff but when i write stuff that's just in my head people as a rule say we, we don't care pen well, I think this is going to change well, that maybe, maybe. because it's really compelling. It's an incredibly great, like it's a great concept and a great character. That doesn't happen all the time. Well, thank you. It, I'm very excited about it. I bet it gets made now into something. Yeah, well, we're talking now. Someone's talking about optioning it again. But you know show business very well. You know that yes. things don't happen. You, you well, you know, for me, everything's happened that I've ever wanted. <laughs> it's so weird. Just think I want to be this and it happens. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, well, I hope it does. It's really, to me, just hearing it, it just seemed like I could see it. I mean, in a way, maybe you can tell that it was a screenplay first. You could see it. Maybe because of being in Vegas, you could see. It's just, I don't anyway, know. It's fantastic. I recommend it all to you, all of you. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, so how, I mean, peop, people know about your libertarianism and, of course, that you've, you know, you are not an anti-vaxxer or an anti-masker. I am not that. Um, so um, my question is, what, um, what are other things that changed you from the pandemic? Were you, did you feel that you were, not your essential nature, obviously, but things that you would say are different because of just experiencing the lockdown or experiencing being at home more or something like that? Well, I, uh, I realized that wanting to spend a lot more time with my family is not a reasonable goal that I really desire. Oh, <laughs> interesting, uh -huh. yeah. I think spending, I was spending a fine amount of time with my family before the pandemic. <laughs> okay. I didn't think we had to put right. that up at all. Um, but we did. Um, and uh, your kids were home from school, were they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so everyone was home. I, 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 well, maybe, I, I, I guess every, everybody would, would have a, a different argument on this, but I think being 15 and 16 and locked in, locked in the house with your parents is yeah. probably, uh, probably the worst. I mean, it was, it, it was terrible for my children. I, I, I just said, you know, uh, you don't want to talk to me. You know what I mean? You want to you want to you want to have be with your peers and so on. But the real thing that changed is I don't really uh, any longer identify as libertarian. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's for me. That's good news because and I'm. The, and the reason is, um, <laughs> uh, it's a cliche of political belief to say that um, 
you know, I didn't leave the movement, the movement left me, but I, it was during lockdown, it was before, it was before the vaccine, and um, I got an email that said that there was an anti-mask rally in Vegas, and they would just assume that I would be leading it. Oh, wow. And when I read that email, um, everything changed. Um, because, uh, I mean, I think it was Steve Allen that said, my, my right to swing my arm stops at your face. Um, and the fact that people had always said libertarians were, um, you know, selfish, rich, white guys who didn't give a fuck about everybody else, and that didn't seem true, and it, with that email it did. And um, uh, I, I can make the argument, I don't think I'm, I will, but I believe I could make it that maybe the government shouldn't use violence to enforce masks. Maybe there's other ways to do that. Mm -hmm. I could make that argument. I don't think I would. But you cannot make the argument that people shouldn't wear masks. You can make the argument, I believe I can, that it may be your right to not wear seatbelts, but I can't make the argument that it's your right to drive drunk. And the fact that many people who were calling themselves libertarians were not differentiating between actions that were your freedom and actions that would hurt other people. Right. Uh, I, I always believed. Yeah. <laughs> I always believed, and I argued for, for hours with Lawrence O'Donnell, who's one of my best friends from SNBC, and Al Franken, who's a friend. I argued with them for hours that um, libertarianism was responsibility. It was more responsibility than the other political thing because you had to think about every decision, what would this do for other people, as opposed to having the government decide you had to make this decision. And when um, it turned out that the pandemic happened and virtually everybody publicly who was speaking about libertarianism was leaving out the responsibility part. Right. Which it's, it, that's leaving out the most important part. There's nothing but responsibility, in my view, of libertarianism. But the question that was always important to me as, as a libertarian or as a, as a citizen was with any problem that we get, is there a way we can solve this problem with more freedom instead of less? And sometimes the answer is going to be no. To that. Yeah. But... I think the question should be asked, it shouldn't automatically be, should we go to force? And my, I came to libertarianism from being a peacenik. Um, I, I have, I, I don't, I think force, there are very few cases where I think force is justified. I mean, mm -hmm. if someone is hitting me, I don't think force is justified for me to hit them back. I'm that far. Wow. So with libertarianism, the idea of someone in my name Right. Using force uh, of the police to something. But if it's protecting someone else, you've got to always weigh that. Another thing that happened to me... Um, but wait, I just want to get clear. So the, the, you came from it at a peacenik thing, so you felt like you didn't feel like you could be wanted to be, say, drafted or forced into a war or forced us into oh, no, violence. No, I, was, I was saying even more. I like even just I, in a personal way, too. I didn't yeah. think that people should be forced by the government to um, say the Pledge of Allegiance, or to right. go to school, or to, you know, that using force, using a gun in order to I accomplish see. stuff. But now, uh, in, in society, I mean, after, after January 6th, we, we saw right. that, the, that, the, that the government, in order to maintain any sort of um, semblance of, uh, of freedom, uh, needs to use more force than I previously thought was necessary. I mean, we may have already lost what we had of democracy. I mean, that may be a fait to complete with this next election. I know, I don't I'm know. so frightened. But um, uh, the other thing I want to say, uh, and I think maybe if you don't understand this or I don't say it well, uh, I'll just be seen as the sickest fuck in the world, but <laughs> the fact that the virus spread around the world to everybody instantly uh, gave me, and I always had the feeling that we were connected, uh -huh. everybody. But it, you know, uh, I don't think it was Al Gore that originally said it, but uh, it might have been Hubble that originally said it, that 
but somebody said that as soon as there was a picture of all of Earth, oh right, that yeah, we could see it from out there, that there would be a change in in everybody, and yeah, that did it, but somehow the virus going all around the world that quickly right. gave me a feeling. I I know this sounds sick and terrible, but it gave me a feeling of connectedness and that we're all in this together. And I've always said to my children that uh, I'm very against uh, tribalism. It always makes me uncomfortable. Even s sporting events, even skeptics groups at some level, it, it's a little bit creepy to me. I always tell my children, you know, you have two choices. You're one of one or you're one of 7.8 billion. And there's no tribes under that. I mean, I'm not comfortable identifying as a man. I'm not comfortable identifying as American. I'm not comfortable. I think it should be the whole world. And I felt that for many, many years. But during the virus, as I, you know, had had f friends of mine dying mm -hmm. and friends suffering mm -hmm. and me suffering, you know, um, and teller suffering. Um, and being able to picture that happening all over the world. Right. Uh, uh, gave me a feeling of, of um, universal community. Uh, I know it's coming from a negative place, but the feeling in my heart was positive. Do I sound like a monster? Or does anybody understand? <laughs> no, you I'm don't. Not, I'm not no, that's saying good. there was anything good about the virus. <laughs> no, I understand. But I do see, as I get older, I understand how the tribes that people associate themselves with and all the different sports fans, religions, whatever, um, really are seeking a kind of safety. I mean, like, like I really get it now when people, like if you moved to a town and you were a single mom and you would go join a church, like you would, like I get that would make your life better. You would know more people that you could help and be helped by. I said absolutely contradictory things. I realized that. I said that the community of the church was very, very important. Then I said I'm very much against tribes. I think I have this um, unrealistic ideal of the feeling of community that I got when I was going to my church when I was when right. I was a child uh, could be for everybody always. Um, but you know, uh, maybe that's just something we um, uh, we hope for. It's 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 wonderful to to feel part of a group. I just want those groups to be bigger and bigger and bigger and more inclusive. Right, and also just not with the mythology as truth. I mean. Yeah. To me, that's the part that's the most but upsetting. But I, I really, I really think, uh, I really think that so many of our political problems now are 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 simply loneliness. Uh, the, the loneliness seems to be crushing. And also, just seeming to want to identify with the tribe, even if it's just Republican or, you know, like people want to be like people keep talking about the religiosity going down so dramatically like in the US, like all the numbers show yeah. that like a huge percent, like just in the last 10 years, like 20% less. But actually that frightens me because now I feel like there's free agents out there to sign up for something else that can take up all of their thinking. That's frightening. I mean, I hear what you're saying. I believe that in a positive way, but it also scares me. I also think that we, we won't know this for years and years, but uh, the fact that there are, uh, that we've found a way to, to monetize outrage and hate, right. I think is a, uh, might be even more important uh, than it seems. I mean, it used to be if, if you started talking racism in your town, your friends, people you met at restaurants and stuff would say, what the fuck is wrong with right. you? you know, they slap you around a little bit. And um, now, if a guy gets crazy ideas in his head, like Travis Bickle and Taxi Driver, he he can have an email from the Grand Wizard of the KKK within 48 hours. Right. And um, so... It's like, do we want everyone to have so much access and information? Well, I thought it was good. Maybe not. I thought it was good. You know, in the, in the 90s, um, I mean, uh, Chip Denman's here somewhere. I, I remember Chip and I talking, all of us talking, with Rob Pike and Ron Gomez and all these guys, we all talked all the time about how as they got more communication and everybody had a voice, that it was going to be oh, I know. lead to peace. <laughs> and have, I, 
I, I've been more wrong than that. But if you've been more wrong than that, <laughs> you just could not have been more wrong. That and, and there's this great book, and I, I, I recommend it all the time. Uh, Jonathan Rausch uh, wrote a book. He's a fabulous writer. Right. He wrote a book called The um, uh, uh, Constitution of Knowledge um, that is the smartest book about this that, that I've seen. And um, he talks about how, how come Wikipedia got it right? Wikipedia, with a bunch of rules, found a way to make it so there's one Obama page that everyone has to agree on those facts. Yeah. And I know we all have Wikipedia horror stories of things that were horribly No, wrong but mostly it's fantastic. It's, it's a miracle, Wikipedia. But if, if Twitter and Facebook and, and, and TikTok, for the love of Christ, could be, could be more, uh, more in the mold of Wikipedia, that was the utopia I was picturing. Right. Wikipedia is what I wanted for the future. And what I ended up getting was a fucking guy with hair that looked like cotton candy made of piss spewing <laughs> hate and changing and destroying my whole country. Yeah. That's what I got. I did what the... I wanted was Wikipedia. I know, exactly. No, it's true. I mean, it's too bad there isn't some kind of government regulation that could encourage that. But I was there too, like going to TED conferences and Facebook was new and I was like, this is the dawn of a new age. We're going to all find each other. We're going to all love each other. And I was, couldn't have been more wrong. And it's really, it's hard not to become jaded, especially I'm a certain age now. It's hard. I have to fight not becoming jaded by it. Like you, you giving get, up. Like, there's okay. A, there's a very small step from uh, this is going wrong to get off my lawn. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and uh, I worry about that a lot. You know, I, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm 67 years old. And I know that um, we know, we know from books and studies and everything else that um, my fear and my worry about the world changing is a big part my age. But I do think there are some uh, objective things that are happening in terms of the Electoral College and in terms of um, secretaries of state and voting right. that, that I think, I, I think may be um, bad even if you're 30. Yeah, I think so too. I guess for me, I'm always fighting this feeling that the tide of history and forces that are so beyond me and really all of us are so big that there's really not that much you can do to have any effect on it. But there's one group that's working very, very hard to change the world for the better, and that is McDonald's. Because they <laughs> keep delivering Big Macs to that fuck, and eventually he's gonna die, right? Oh my God. <laughs> so Can, go McDonald's. Okay, but wait, that brings me to this. You can't say anything about The Apprentice. Did you have to sign an NDA or anything like that after being on The Apprentice? Like, you, can you say anything about Trump? Congress or? shall make no law respecting the established religion to prove me the pre exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or writing people to freely assemble to address the government for the redress of their grievances. I can say anything you want about it. <laughs> Celebrity Apprentice. I did two tours of duty. So I, I know Celebrity Apprentice. And I knew Trump before that. We watched yeah. him take Atlantic City into the toilet. Yeah. I, he was on, he hosted a Mother's Day special on SNL. But, <laughs> oh my God, when I look back, I wouldn't even take the elevator down to watch him do anything with my own mother. I was so, I was angry they even had him on SNL. Yeah. Because I felt like they were just promoting this idiot. And, you know, well, that you was know, part I, of what happened. He, there's, what I had uh, uh, Donald Trump Jr. said to me uh, that he, I was the only person he ever met who seemed to like his father. What? Really? And um, uh, he said, why is that? Wh how come you're not scared and you get along with them? And so he equates fine? liking somebody of not being scared of them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, well, that's interesting. But, he, uh, but it, was, it was other <laughs> stuff, too. And I, he asked me to explain it. And I have, um, uh, you know, the long-suffering Glenn will say it's, it's, it's one of the problems in his life. I have incredible tolerance for eccentricity. Um, I love it. I love people that are way, way off the bell curve. I think. We yeah, learn, I do too. I think we, you can't be in show business without liking that. Yeah, I we, mean, lear yeah. we learn a lot about, I mean, whether it's epileptics with split brain or whether it's... <laughs> 
Tiny Tim, you know, one of my one of my heroes in show business, who uh, I think was probably on the spectrum. Um, and whether you have people that do it with drugs, I think Hendrix uh, invented a lot of stuff because of drugs taking right? the filter I think away. So too. Or whether you do it with absolute pure raw genius and willpower, right. like the Bard from Minnesota, Bob Dylan. Um, but even people who are not heroic, uh, I find it really interesting. So I liked the fact that Donald Trump had no filters at all. And I liked the fact in that box of show business that he was really interesting. Right. Yeah, that's true. You, yes, that's undeniable. And um, so I... I was cordial. I mean, what, what, what Celebrity Apprentice is, is it is a partially improvised soap opera. You know, right. That's essentially what it is. And uh, other people took it very seriously. You know, they talked about getting fired. And I said, by the way, he can't fire you. He's right. not your boss. Right. He does not have a job to offer you. Right. You're on a television show. <laughs> <laughs> but other people had real trouble. And they would yeah. say, we're going into the boardroom. And I'd say, we're not going into the boardroom. We're going to the boardroom set. Yeah. It's a different thing. And, you know, he would talk about, you know, me doing these jobs for him. And I would say, I I'm on a TV show, like you. Um, but... Um, I, I, I suspect that didn't help you move forward on The Apprentice. I, I, <laughs> I did very well on okay. Celebrity Apprentice. Um, I'm very proud to say. Okay, well. Wow. Um, actually, um, <laughs> it was down, uh, the, um, the final one was down to Trace Adkins, you know, country guy, and me were down to the final two. And we had some bullshit thing like selling ice cream. <laughs> and my ice cream uh, outsold Trace like four to one or something. I done all the tasks pretty well. They came in, I, mean, what, I don't know what year this was, I guess like eight, eight, nine years ago, I guess. Glenn will know and he'll yell it out if I'm too wrong. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, they came into my dressing room. This is the final show that's gonna be live. Came into my dressing room, they said, um, uh, if Donald Trump runs for president, would you support him? And I went, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> right? Oh my God. <laughs> No, absolutely not. And they said, well, we've been told to report back to Donald Trump, and you might want to say yes, because that is going to affect who wins. <gasps> and I said, what? <laughs> no. You're kidding. I won't support him. No, no way. And Joan Rivers said, um, she was backstage with him, uh -huh. and Joan was a friend of mine. And um, Joan said, you know, he's, he's, he's going crazy because you've won all the tasks, and he really doesn't want to have you win, you know? Oh. And so uh, it was this real heavy thing coming down. And then Trace won. And then the, uh, the ice cream company was so angry, they came to me and gave me double the money for my charity. And <laughs> NBC apologized to me. But... Um, wow. I, will I, I don't know if I should tell this story. Yes! Although we are over a little bit. I said, okay. Okay, we can go over it. Okay. Well, tell it. I think this story... Uh, I hope I hope you take it in the spirit. <laughs> I mean it because it's a it's a repulsive story. Can't Don wait. Donald Trump said to me on camera more than once, more than twice, about three times. He said to me, "You know, Penn, you're one of the three people I've met who is smarter than me." And they said, how does that make you feel? And I said, it makes me feel like he hasn't met many people. <laughs> um, I know, and they interviewed me a lot about this. And they put you in these little rooms and they say, he actually said this to you, that you're one of the three smartest people. What do you think about that? And I said, um, uh, I know Richard Feynman. I mean, I knew Richard Feynman. I, I met Marie Gilman. You know, uh, I met Bob Dylan. I mean, I know Nobel Prize winners. I have met, uh, well, let's take Richard Feynman for an example. If you asked Richard Feynman how many people are smarter than you, Richard Feynman would not be able to parse the question. 
The fact that you can ask that question shows that you have no understanding of intelligence whatsoever. Exactly. Because the question, and I, I, don't, I don't tell this story. I mean, um, my friend Lawrence Krauss asked if he could tell this story in, a, in an editorial he was writing in the New York Times. And I said, no, because someone's going to say, you know, Penn's bragging that Donald Trump thinks he's smarter than him. And that's not the point of the story. Right. The point of the story is you've got a person who is so deeply deluded and mentally ill. Yeah, mentally that ill. That he thinks he can... <laughs> He has three people. The number is hysterical. I know the number is hysterical. Ooh, and I know one of the other ones is Carrot Top and <laughs> Polly Shore. Penn Jillette, Polly Shore, Carrot Top. It's easy who those three are. But um, uh, by the way, I never found out the other two. Um, but if you asked Richard Feynman, he would have said, well, what do you mean? At, at, right. at, at knowing how an internal combustion engine works? Yeah. Because I know there's... A lot of people smarter than me on that. Do you mean DNA? Well, there's thousands smarter than me on that. Do you mean um, do you mean um, particle physics? Well, there's a lot smarter than me on that. I mean, there's no there's no way you can put a number to that. Right. You know, no matter how smart you are, no matter who you are in what field, you can't put a number to that. And when he said that to me. Everybody thought it was about me, <laughs> and I thought it was about the depth of his mental illness. Yeah. Um, the other two things I want to say about him that I think are so, so creepy and that <laughs> haven't been talked about. I love about, where this is going. That <laughs> haven't been talked about was I've been around Donald Trump in, with, a, with a band playing on stage and me standing next to him. Okay, uh -huh. a band playing on stage, right. me standing next to him, playing rock and roll. And I've looked down at his foot, and it's not moving. And oh. I watched him, because I noticed this early on, I watched him whenever music was playing, and I never saw a physical reaction to the music. Now, I know he does that grotesque Yeah, he does do dance. We've seen him dance. To YMCA. I don't know it's about queers. <laughs> YMCA. <laughs> and, you know, Fortunate Son, which if I had to pick one song in popular music that Donald Trump should not play about himself, right. it's Fortunate Son. Right. And when the band played Hail to the Chief, they point the cannon at you, y'all. <laughs> yes, John Fogarty. Uh, anyway, uh, didn't tap his foot, no appreciation for music yeah. that I could see at all. He does that weird thing like he's moving like he saw other humans do it, yeah. but it's not in time. Right. And I will bet you dollars to donuts he can't find two and four. Right. Um, but um, the other thing that bothered me even more is I never heard him make a joke yeah. or laugh at a joke. Yeah. And I'm defining joke differently than Donald Trump would. A joke is not, she's fat. Right. Not a joke. But he would laugh at that right. a lot. Uh, a joke at someone's expense, uh, uh, an insult, he'll laugh at. But I never saw him laugh or enjoy a joke. Now, I lived for two years on the streets. I hitchhiked. I op trains. I stayed. I, I was in jail overnight. I stayed in in in. in biker clubhouses, never, ever saw anybody, no reaction to music, never laughed at a joke, and uh, no shame about anything ever. Yeah. And it turns out that no shame is sadly a superpower. Because if I told yeah, you that's right true. now, you can have everything you want in the world, including world peace, but you have to promise me that you will never apologize or admit you were wrong for the rest of your life. I contend you could not do it. And I contend very few people could do it. I contend that Trump has done it. Yeah. And that is so far off the bell curve that he may have taken a bunch of us uh, into, a, into a world of hurt. It must be so wild to have had such intimate experience with him, like being around him so much. We and only then had having... sex once. <laughs> Was it consensual, though? Uh, one of us. <laughs> okay, my last thing, and then we got to get out of here. Um, so here we are. We're getting older. Do you ever think about slowing down at all? I mean, you're doing so many things. It's amazing. 
I just imagine you continuing on. But do you ever even think that uh, you want to slow down? Uh, no. Uh, I, I mean, when I was um, when I was 15 or 16 years old, it's, it seemed to me impossible that I could ever even one day work in show business. My dream would have been, which was impossible, I would have thought there was no chance, would be to think of ideas and do them and have people enjoy them and react to them. I uh, lucked out with the, um, with I believe the best partner anyone could ever have. Teller is the, um, the best magic mind alive today. Uh, Teller is uh, never late. He does not make mistakes. He is 100% reliable. Um, he is kind and he is um, learned and erudite. And um, because of Teller, uh, I've gotten uh, everything I ever wanted. And uh, I don't know why I can't understand golf. <laughs> Pe people work so hard in show business to get to be able to do what they want, and then they choose to do something else during the day. <laughs> I mean, all I ever wanted was to do shows. And, you know, you know like there's Sinatra, who did not quit at the peak. He kept yeah. singing until he wasn't good. And Johnny Carson went out at the absolute peak. Yeah. He was great when he went out. I'm just telling you right now, I'm Sinatra. <laughs> I am going okay, to be on stage <laughs> when I suck, suck, suck. You're going to be able to say, why is he still on stage? He can't do fucking anything. And you're going to say, he told us, <laughs> Julia Sweeney. I mean, when you see that I'm appearing somewhere in 20 years, don't go to the show. I'm going to suck, but I'm going to be there, God damn it. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Ken, honey. That was so great. We're so lucky to have him as part of our community. Ken Gillette.